morning, Fellowship Church. It's Christmas season. Park the hair. Amen. Good morning, Fellowship Church. Good morning, my brothers and sisters watching online. Uh, welcome. If this is your first time to Fellowship Church, we just want to say uh, good morning and welcome. And we have these folders in the foyer. If you'd like to know more about our church family, uh, please see uh, one of the uh, pastors that are uh, out there. There is Rudy and Brandon. They'll be happy to give you one, or you can find me as well. So we just have a couple of announcements. They're big announcements. The first one is Tomorrow we have our bread box distribution taking place at 5 o'clock. So if you know of a family or if you yourself would like to come by and get a bag of groceries, we would love to bless you, bless our community. So you can come just right through the breezeway there at 5 o'clock and the, the bread box distribution team will be ready to give you those groceries. So there's another thing that's taking place today right after third service. How many of you know what that is? There's a hint. Night in Bethlehem, yes, yes. You can see I'm sporting the yellow shirt. So we're going to continue to build sets. We're going to pick up hay, and we would love to have your help. So come on right after third service. We're going to even have some pizza for you so you can get fueled up or weighed down. I don't know, but you know, we, we want to we get you going and, and ready to work out there. We can't do it alone, so we just want to invite you to come and help. And then if you are playing a role in Night in Bethlehem, 
The costumes are ready for you to pick up. If you haven't picked them up, it's in the common area as soon as you walk out to the left. So we want you to get your costume. We have dress rehearsal taking place this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Six, can everybody say that? What time? Okay, good. So everybody here should know. And you can tell your friends and neighbors, whoever's playing a part at Night in Bethlehem, be here for rehearsal at 6 o'clock. And we'll go through the set. We'll pray over uh, the whole Night in Bethlehem scenes. And uh, we're just excited about what God is going to do and how the message of Jesus Christ is going to be shared uh, to the community. So also, Advent devotional week number two is out there in the foyer. You can pick one up. For those of you online, we have them available for you as well. It's PDF, and you can go to our website and uh, download the Advent devotional. We also have the December prayer focus, so I just want to remind you to keep praying over uh, this month, uh, the specific areas that we've asked you to pray over. And then last but certainly not least, we have our bulletin. So anything that I've said that you've forgotten, or maybe you're one of those that likes to read the stuff or to really you know, help you remember, it's in this bulletin. We also want to encourage you to fill it out. Uh, there's a perforated little sheet here. It's our communication card. Let us know if you have a prayer request or a prayer um, of praise or something that you want to let us know about so we can be praying for you this week or celebrating with you, rejoicing with you, and, and what the Lord is doing in your lives. If you're interested in serving in a particular ministry, this is another way for you to kind of let us know about that. And you can drop these off in one of the boxes in the back. Okay, let's stand. Let's continue to worship. And we just want to take a moment before we jump into worship. Let's just, uh, as a church body, let's pray for Night in Bethlehem. Uh, Father God, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Uh, it, it's, this is why we're doing Night in Bethlehem, God. We want people to be taken back to that time when you, in your perfect timing, sent your son as a baby born in a manger who would be our Savior. Lord, I pray that you would move in this community to come hear your message. Lord, I pray for the hands and feet that are putting together the sets, that are making cookies, that are directing traffic, that will be uh, playing a role in the scenes. Lord, use us. Thank you for your spirit and dwelling in this place. We ask that you would continue to move us, Lord Jesus, towards you. As you are a light unto this world, let us be a light unto this community. Thank you for this time that we have with you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
choice but to bow Chains have no choice but to break Shame has no choice but to leave In your presence, God And fear has no choice but to bow Chains have no choice but to break Shame has no choice but to lean in your presence. And fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave. done before in greater measure but you will do again there's no prison wall you can break through no mountain you can move all things are possible there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible on the darkest night you can light it up oh you can light it up oh god of a revival let hope arise death has overcome god you've already won oh god of a revival you rose in victory and now you're seated forever on your throne so why should my heart fear what you've defeated I will trust in you alone Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible Cause there's no broken body you can't raise No soul that you can't save All things are possible the darkest night you can light it up Lord you can light it up oh God of revival let hope arise death has overcome oh you've already won God of ask God to awaken us we need a church come awaken your people come awaken your city oh God of revival pour it out pour it out 
and every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people, come awaken your city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. In the darkest of night, you can light it up. Oh, you can light it up. Oh, God of revival, let hope arise. Death has overcome. Oh, you've already won. Revival. There's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move. All things are possible. Cause there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save. All Things are possible. Amen. Church, you, um, <clears throat> do you remember what the angel said to Mary? When Mary says, how, how can these things be? Because I'm just a virgin. How, how am I going to have a baby? And the angel says, with God, all things are possible. And then from that moment, we've been going through Mark, seeing Jesus Make impossible things possible things. Making sick well and demon oppressed free. Today we're going to making water into solid ground. Making sack lunches into feast. That's what Jesus does. He makes impossibilities, possibilities, and then realities. Man, the, the impossibility of God becoming flesh. Man, that's, I'm so thankful that that became a reality. I have uh, one more song, How Great Is Your Love. And my, my favorite part of it, it says, From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us. And that's, that's Christmas right there and I don't I don't want us to to short change that 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 God wasn't a, a, a king who stepped off his throne to hang among the commoners and he wasn't a CEO that just came down the elevator from his penthouse office to to see how the rest of the co-workers were doing and he left heaven a throne in heaven with angels worshiping him constantly to come down and, and, and not to just as a baby when, when Mary delivered but to come into the womb to make himself that fragile that he had become a, a fetus the, the God of the universe for us From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, you lifted me up How great is your love You bore my weakness, you took my shame Buried my burdens in fields of grace. 
You called me out, you lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us, and we are amazed. Oh, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love! How great, how great, how great is your love, how great, how great, how great is your love for us. With your kindness, lead me home. In your presence, where I belong. Call me out. Lifted me up. How great is your love? Oh, from the heights of heaven, you step down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us, and we are amazed. God, we stand in awe, for we have been changed. By the power of the cross, how great, how great, how great is your love, how great, how great, how great is your love, how great, how great, how great is your love for us. There's never been church. Never been, and there will never be a God like you, a love so true. There has never been, no, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. What other king would do that? There. What other God? A God like you, the love so true. There has never been, no, there will never be. A God like you, the love so true. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love, God. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. Thank you. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great is your love for us. Thank you, Jesus. Before Chris comes up, I want us to just sing one more thing. Oh, come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord sing it out
Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully. For the wind was against them, and about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But he immediately, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to a land of Genesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as, as were touched, they were made well. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for these amazing miracles of you walking on water, you healing people time and time again. I pray that as we read through the gospel account according to Mark, God, that it doesn't become something we gloss over or something that becomes old hat, Father, but something that we're amazed at every time when you walk into a city, you walk into a town, you heal people. God, I know that you desire to be present here right now within our hearts, within our lives, and you desire to heal us in the things that are sicknesses within us, both physically and spiritually. And I just pray over to this congregation. I pray over uh, Chris as he brings the message of truth to us uh, this morning, that you just bless him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, well, first thing I want to do is just say thank you so much. Um, you guys are amazing. You guys are one of the most amazing uh, giving churches that I've ever seen. Uh, yesterday, where you're sitting was full of Christmas presents, and we had an opportunity through Gift of Joy to deliver pre uh, presents last night to some families in our area. They were so blessed. They are so thankful, um, and that's because of your generosity and the way that you you give. And I just want to say thank you from um, the bottom of my heart for all that you're going to do this week serving for Bethlehem um, and just the way that you have been a blessing to our community. And it truly is a message to our community. I got a chance to sit um, in just some amazing people's homes that I've never met before and, and just the sense of thank you for coming into my home and sitting with me and providing something um, for my children for this Christmas season. It just spoke volumes to them of the love of God um, that is there, and that's because of you and your gifts. And so I just want to say special thank you um, from our pastors and from our church for all that you do um, for that. And today we're talking about just a, probably a familiar story, and we're going to dive in deep to it. And this is the idea of Jesus walking on the water. And you've probably heard this story before, but we live in a society today that wants to demiracleize. And I know that's probably not a word, but I'm going to make it a word today, okay? They want to demiracleize the Bible. In other words, they want to take the stories that are in the Bible and say, that's impossible. There's no way that could have happened. Um, and they, they just, in their mind, because of science, people don't walk on water. Because of life experience. And let's be honest. How many of us have tried to walk on water before? Any, give me some hands. Give me some hands. Okay. Come on. Come on. I know more of y'all have been like, okay, on the side of the pool. And you're like, okay, video in slow-mo, right? And you just run. And you try to do the, if you bend and... Okay, that was me this summer, but maybe for y'all, it was when you were a kid. But we all try it at some point. Lord, just let me slide on the water. We all have tried this before, but we have a society that wants to say that's impossible. Science, life experience, these things, they're impossible. Guys, have you ever, I know you don't often get quotes in a sermon from the Princess Bride, okay? I know that's not true, right? Um, but there's a scene in there where they keep using the word inconceivable, right? And, and they, in, the, in the movie, he goes, I don't think you know what that word means, right? The idea of miracle, 
means it doesn't make sense to us. That's, that's the very definition of the word. By the way, how many of us want to worship a God that makes sense to us? That wouldn't make him God at all. You see, we have a tendency in our world to not want to believe because it doesn't make sense to us. But today, as we look at the story, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think that Jesus really walked on the water? Do you think so? I mean, because the world thinks you're crazy. You are crazy. There's no way. But yet we say we have a God that does the impossible. So that means for us, regardless of the situation that you're in or the trial that you're in, we have a God that can overcome that. He, he can do all things. He can do the impossible. And so we dive into this story, and I just think it's an incredible testimony today to who God is. And we need to hear this today because in our mind, we tend to try to make God into something that makes sense to us. And instead, he's the God of revival. We need to wake up to the reality of who he is. So let's dive in. Um, immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So remember our scene from last week. Jesus has fed the 5,000, right? Little boy's lunch fed 5,000 people. The people wanted to make him king. So he sends his disciples in the boat, says, hey, I need you to go over to the other side. Now, if you might remember, the reason that Jesus fed the 5,000 was because it was in the evening. And the disciples had said, we need to send them away so they can go buy food for themselves because it's getting late. So Jesus sends them out probably right after dusk, in order to go over to the other side. And Jesus takes time to get away and get recharged. He says, while he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. So again, we see Jesus has this habit of detaching from everyone to get recharged, to spend time with the Father. Now remember, the reason that we're doing this series on the book of Mark is because of our mission statement, loving God and transforming lives by following Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. Amen? That's the reason that we're here is so that we can try to transform our lives to become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as Jesus gets away to pray, we need to get away to pray. I know I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today, but do you believe that prayer works? Yes. This week has been an amazing week for prayer in our church. Um, we had an opportunity. We sang prison doors are set open, right? Gaston, one of our beloved friends, got to come home this week from three months down in San Antonio to be able to be set free from these trials. I got to see him this morning, and man, it was so glorious to see that God answers our prayers. This week, we've had people come home from the hospital. Hope Woods is back home, right? We saw PET scans for Josh Boyd's body show up. There's not cancer all over his body. Finally, some good news after months and months and months of praying. We see Mitchell Ehrman have a chance to come home, going from ICU to be able yeah, praise the Lord. That's awesome, right? We see Mitchell Ehrman going from ICU to being able to come home. Praise God. And the doctors give praise to God? We should be giving praise to God because he answers our prayers. And so we see Jesus here detaching to pray. And so I want to encourage you over these holiday seasons, in fact, every day to detach and recharge with God. Here's two things that you need to do. If you want to recharge with God, you have to, number one, be intentional to get plugged in. You know your phone is the thing I think of most often when we think about recharging. If you set your phone on the nightstand, it doesn't magically charge itself. You have to plug it in. You have to put it on the charger for it to actually plug in. Here's the second thing. Recharging with God takes time. I know it's really cute, five-minute devotionals, 30-second devotionals. Like, we're getting down to the point where, like, one-second devotional, right? It takes time for you to recharge with God. Don't make your time with God into some five-minute segment that you do sometime. It takes time for us to get filled up with the power and the glory of God, and it has to be intentional time. Guys, what better thing can we do every day than plug into the Father? I know we have a list of things that we really like to do, but man, every day we have to plug in and get recharged, or we're going to run out of our ability to, to see him at work. We're going we're gonna to see ourselves become spiritually dead. And we see this example in Jesus constantly stepping away, and recharging with the Father. And so he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. 
and he saw that they were making headway painfully. So Jesus is up on the mountain praying. He's looking out over the Sea of Galilee, and he sees the disciples in the boat. So he can see them from, from his vantage point, and he sees that they're making their way. The headway is painful. And when you read this uh, scripturally, it kind of says, they were straining at the oars. Right? The wind was resisting them, as we read here, for the wind was against them. And they're struggling in their progress, trying to get to the other side of the sea. Anybody been in some times of uh, struggle? Times where it seems like everything is pushing back against you? That's what we find the disciples in. Right? Jesus told them, go towards Bethsaida, go that way. They're obeying God, and it seems like every time they go anywhere, they can't make any headway. And they're struggling, and they're struggling. And Jesus is up on the mountain praying for them, looking over the sea. Now remember, the Sea of Galilee was 705 feet below sea level. So it had this crazy weather phenomenon that happened. But for the disciples, they didn't understand the weather. They didn't understand the reasons. All they knew was this place of chaos. Winds and storms and all these things just came up, and it was a place of confusion and chaos for them. So here they are. Imagine yourself. Again, put yourself in the scene. You're a disciple. You're straining at the oars, doing what Jesus wants you to do, but you're not making any progress. You're in this dark place. You're in this chaotic place. It's just it's not the place that you want to be in. I want to be by Jesus' side. I, I want to be with him, but here I am obeying him, but walking through this process. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. So the fourth watch, remember the Jewish day, started at 6 p.m. So it went three-hour segments. So the first three hours, the first watch would have been 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then 9 p.m. to midnight. Now you're living in my time. This is where my world works. All right? And then midnight to 3, so then 3 to 6. So the fourth watch would have been somewhere around 3 a.m. in the morning. Jesus starts walking out over the water. By the way, that means that they were struggling at the oars for a while. It, it, it was a while they were struggling. And Jesus was recharging with the Father for a while. And then he walks out to them, walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. On top of the sea. Now, you'll hear some crazy things. We're talking about the de miracleization of our Bible. You'll hear some crazy theories. One is that Jesus was walking on a sandbar. That there was just a sandbar, and he was walking out there three miles or so out there on a sandbar that the boat already sailed over, but just, okay, probably not, right? Here's one, right? They said that Jesus is walking on the water was just a mirage. He was actually walking on the shore, but it just seemed like that because it was a mirage. And I would go, I don't think you know what that word means, right? Because a mirage happens when you're in the desert and the sun and the heat happens. And this happens at night on water. So probably not happening. In fact, we know that Jesus, when he walks in the water, they would have been able to see him because we know what time of year this was. This was the Passover, and in the Jewish calendar, which was lunar cycled, we know that the Passover was the first Sunday past the full moon. So there was probably a full moon, and Jesus comes walking out on the water. Now, when you look at this next phrase, he meant to pass by them, you might think, wait, he was just going to pass them? That seems, me that seems weird. Why would he just go walk past them? He could have walked any direction that he wanted to. Why would he just walk past them? But remember, we're taking the things that happened in Jesus' life and echoing back into the Old Testament. Do you remember any time that God passed by people in the Old Testament? Maybe Moses in Exodus 33 in the cleft of the rock where God's glory passed by him. Or maybe Elijah in 1 Kings 19 where um, the Spirit of God passed by him and they got to experience the glory of the Lord. And so when I read this, I don't think, well, Jesus wasn't going to, he was just going to skip by and say, good luck, guys. Or do we think maybe God was like, I'm going to pass by so they could see his, my glory, right? Maybe that's a better answer for what's going on here, right? And so he went to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. So again, put yourself in the disciples' shoes, right? They are straining on the oars in the middle of a lake, and they look over, and there's someone walking there. Okay? Any of us, would we cry out? Would we freak out? Like, okay, let me ask you this question. How many of you in your homes have, like, the jump scare person? 
that like hangs around like waiting at the door when you walk in to say hello. They're like, boo, and you're, ah. Um, I live with, in fact, I'm married to that person, okay? <laughs> My beautiful, loving wife, she loves to jump scare you. I apologize. If you come over for dinner or game night, you might get scared. She might just jump out of nowhere. By the way, she's the most skittish of all of us because we get her all the time, right? We probably actually learned it from the Cedillo house, because if you go to the Cedillo house, you might get scared as well, right? So we, we like to jump because there's something scary when you don't know someone's there and all of a sudden they are there. In fact, um, one of the worst things that I, I've ever done as a person, um, probably, was we were going to do a jump scare. I think it was Karis, my daughter and I, we were at a, a children's museum um, up in Philadelphia, I think it was, and we were at just this cool museum, and, and we went in, and they have these things, like you have a sign, and it makes a different face, like because you're from colonial times, and so we were like a pilgrim, and this person, and, and this person was someone else, and we were sitting there, and we were doing this different thing where we were like walking up the stairs, and we were a little ways away, and we looked back, and they weren't up the stairs yet, and we ran behind, we're like, let's jump out and scare them right? Because we know Tara's coming up the stairs. We're going to get her. So Karis and I were hiding there. We had these like fake faces on. They were kind of creepy looking because it's a good idea on paper, but then when you get it out there, it's like creepy. And so we get hiding behind. And as soon as someone walks up, we're going to jump out and scare them, right? Little did we know that our family stopped to look at this hot air balloon that was hanging up right there. And Tara's like in homeschool mom mode. She's like, oh, well, here's how that works and, and all this stuff. Someone else total stranger passed by them, right? And we're just hiding here. We're like, boo! And this poor woman, like, threw her purse and everything. We're like, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's that way. The museum's that way, right? So sometimes we jump out and we scare total strangers. Sometimes it works exactly like they want. But when you have in your mind, I'm in the middle of the ocean. I'm in the middle of the sea. There shouldn't be someone there. And then Jesus shows up they cry out, and they were terrified. They thought it was a ghost. They thought it was a spirit. Perhaps they thought, we're dying. That spirit is coming to get us. It's coming to take us away. Now, I don't know what Jesus looked like walking on the water, right? Did he look like his normal self? Did he kind of take off his costume and walk like God walks, like he did at the transfiguration? Because you know what I mean by costume, right? Like this flesh that we have on, this isn't us. Like, what makes you, you? Is it the flesh covering they have, or is it your spirit and your soul and your personality? You see, there's going to be a day where we get to trade in this costume for a new costume, when we get to go to heaven someday. And I'm looking forward to that, and I hope my new costume is like, oh, like, yeah, like skinny and ripped, and oh, that's what I'm hoping the new imperishable body we get someday is, right? But in the now, we have this like body that we feed, and then we have all these cravings from it and all, but Jesus, right, he had the ability to walk as God on the water. And so he's walking, and they see him, and they're scared, and they're terrified, right? And for they saw him, and they were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them, and he said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Maybe we should uh, highlight this and, and type it out and in 2020 put it somewhere that we can read it time after time, right? Take heart, it is I, don't be afraid. But can I ask you when you write it down somewhere to encourage you in these crazy times that we live in that you can write it a little bit different way because this term, it is I, it, it's right in the tense that it's used in the English language, but when you actually look at it in the Greek, it's emi ego, which sounds like something you put in your toaster. It's not that. All right, it's emi ego is this term I am. Now, we've heard this term before, haven't we? This term I am was a term that, um, in fact, in John chapter 8, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, right? This was a term that was reserved for Jesus saying, I am God. So more likely, he was saying, take heart, don't be afraid, I am. I am God. I am here. Have no fear. When we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us, when we have the I am that lives in us, we can rest in confidence that we don't have to be afraid, that God is with us. You know, this I am statement is so incredible. As we start looking through, we see it in Exodus chapter 3, where Moses is before the burning bush and takes off his sandals because it's holy ground, and he says, I am sent you, right? And then we see it in the book of John. Um, John chapter 10, 
right? This verses 9 through 11, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And I will go and will go in and go out and find pasture, right? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Do we live that abundant life? And then he says, I am the good shepherd, right? He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Do you remember last week when Jesus got off the boat before he fed the 5,000? He looked at the people, and what did he say about them? They were like sheep without a shepherd, and yet he says, I am the good shepherd, right? A little bit later in the book of John, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth, the life. He is the life, that abundant life. A little bit later in John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. So we know that these I am statements is him saying, I am with you. I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the good shepherd. Follow after me. In the midst of the storms, in the midst of your struggles, trust in me. Take heart. I am with you. And that's what he's telling them here. And we can take that to heart as well. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but were hardened in their hearts. Now, this is an interesting phrase at the end. Let's read this verse 52 again. It says, for they did not understand about the loaves but their hearts were hardened. And it makes you go like, what is it that they didn't understand? They they missed something that all of a sudden this walk, this event of walking on water filled in the gap for them. Well, if you remember in the feeding of the 5,000, right, Jesus fed them. And then last week we read at the end of John chapter 6 where all of a sudden people followed them just so they could get the fill of the bread once again. Guys, If we think that God has only come to solve our problems for us, we're missing out on who God really is. You see, the loaves were designed to show them that he was God. He was their provider. And what they did was they turned God into something that would provide for them and that he would be the only one that could make them happy, only one who could provide for them, only one that could do these things for them. And they began to put their trust in him for their physical but they missed the spiritual purposes of God and the things that go on. Here's the danger. If you only put your hope in God for what he can do for you in the here and the now, you're going to stop trusting in him eventually. Because God will answer our prayers, and sometimes somebody will be healed and be made whole, and other times they're going to be sick and they're going to pass away. Do we trust God even in the hard times? Is he God even in the worst of times? You see, it's really easy to get out of the boat when your boat is sinking. It's harder to get out of the boat when your boat is good. And we have a tendency to trust in God when he does good things for us and doubt God when things don't work exactly what we want to instead of saying, no, we believe that Jesus is truly God. And that's what this story of him walking in the water is supposed to represent for us, that Jesus was God. Do we believe it? That he is God. Even if our world is falling apart, do we believe that he is God? Even if things aren't going exactly like we want them to go, do we believe that he is God? Because God's going to call us to even more. In fact, when you read this story and you get done with Mark's rendition of the story, you kind of might think, wait, didn't Peter get out of the boat? I tend to remember that somewhere. And that's in Matthew chapter 14. Let's go back. Um, and read Matthew's account because Peter doesn't really share his side of the story um, because he's the one that's helping Mark with this account that we're reading. But Matthew goes ahead and and talks to him about it. So let's look at Matthew's account here in verse 28. So Jesus had just said, take heart, don't be afraid, I am, right? That's what it said just right before this. Verse 28 says, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. 
So question, was Peter a failure? It's a valid question. Depends on your, your viewpoint of this story. Because we see Jesus walking in the water. Peter boldly says, Lord, if it's you, call me out. And Jesus says, come on. And Peter steps out of the boat and begins to walk on the water. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you be willing to step out of the boat, risk failure, just to experience walking on the water? Would you be willing to risk failure in order to be with Jesus and to be like Jesus? This is the question that we have to answer um, as believers in Christ, is what would we have done if we were in our boat? If we were in this place, would we be willing to step out and to be like Jesus? Here's a couple of things that I think are important for us to make it practical to our life. And here's the first key to getting out of the boat, okay? Courage has to trump your doubt. You have to be strong and courageous to be a Christian. If you want to be a Christian in today's world, you have to be strong and courageous. You have to say, I'm going to take the step that I am called to take whether anybody else wants me to or not whether people doubt me or not. Now, I know this is, I have to say this in today's world. I'm not talking about COVID. Have you ever noticed that anything that said this word COVID just pops up in our mind? Like, I am not making a deep, dark analogy that your home is your boat and you need to step out of your home and get into the world. I'm not saying that. This is so much deeper than the physical stuff that goes on around us. God is calling you to more in your spiritual walk with him. You see, if you have a spiritual walk that is rich and vibrant, the physical stuff will take care of itself. But God is calling us to step out of our comfort into something new to be like Jesus. But you have to be courageous. You have to find the courage to take that step to be like Jesus. Well, I wonder what it was like. Was the water like firm? Was it like a waterbed? What was it like to get to walk on it? Because we know Peter takes some steps on the water until he starts looking around at his circumstances, until he starts letting doubt creep in and it begins to sink. What is God calling you to do to step out of your comfort, your area? You see, this is one of the things that happens in church. We get really comfortable with our tribe and with our people, and we're scared to step out and disciple other people. We're scared to step out and meet someone new and build new relationships because we're really comfortable in our setting when God is calling us to more. He's calling us to kingdom-minded things. Here's the second thing I think we need to do. We need to have a longing to be like Jesus that overrides our fear. Do you have a desire to be like Christ? I want you to think about this, right? This is our desire. This is our sanctification that we become more like Jesus. So is that longing greater than our fear? Are we willing to step beyond what's the best for me in order to be like Jesus? Here's Peter on the boat, and he goes, wait, Jesus is out there. I want to be there. I want to be with Jesus. Hey, Jesus, can I come out there? And Jesus is like, sure. And Peter's like, okay, right? Why didn't all of them do that? Why weren't all of the disciples like, Jesus, you're out there. I want to be with you. Can we come out? And all of them just started jumping out of the boat and go with them. Only Peter. Only Peter was bold enough to say, let me go out. There. I know it's impossible, but let me go out there with you. And Jesus is like, sure, come be with me. Spend time with me. Come do what I'm doing. Come experience what I'm experiencing, is that longing in us stronger than the longing for the world? Do we desire the things of the world more than we desire being like Jesus? Right? And here's the last thing. you got to be willing to step out of the boat even if no one else will follow. you got to be the one willing to step out and take chances for Jesus even if everybody else thinks you're crazy. I mean, think about this. What were the other disciples thinking when Jesus gets out of the boat? Right? They're now in the grandstand watching Jesus, I mean, watching Peter start walking on the water. I wonder what was going through their mind. Do you think they were like cheering him on? 
Like, as Peter's walking out there and Peter starts to sing, they're like, no, Peter, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep going. You're almost there. Was that, what they, was that the kind of crowd you have around you? Let's be honest. What do we think they were doing? Do you think anybody of the disciples were hoping he would sink? Uh-oh. Dagger, right? Were they hoping he would sink? Were they jealous? Why didn't I think of that? Were they questioning? He's, what is he doing? He's crazy. He's going to die. Peter wasn't going to die. You know why? We know Peter can swim. You know from John chapter 21 where he's on the boat and, and Jesus calls out, throw down your net, and they catch all these fish, and Peter's like, it's Jesus, and he just jumps off the boat, right? And he just jumps in and he swims to the shore, and everybody else is like, I guess we'll bring in the boat, right? And so Peter's always the one just jumping up like, Jesus over there, see ya, right? He's just, that's, that was Peter's MO, right? He always was all in, whatever he did. Oh, they're going to arrest him? Cut out. That was just Peter, right? He's just all in kind of person jumping out there. But the other disciples, what were they thinking? What was going through their mind? I pray that they were like, go, Peter, you can do it, right? Because if Peter made it, maybe they would take the boldness to make it. I pray that we won't be people that hope other people fail, that we're willing to step out of the boat into areas that we're uncomfortable in. Let me give you a testimony of areas that I've had to do that in. Um, number one, this job. Many of you know me. I, have a, I had a desire at one point to be a youth minister my whole life. Like I wanted to die diving for a Frisbee in the end zone, catching it on ultimate and being like, Hey, Jesus, what's up, right? That's what I want to do. Or even better, like I'm at youth camp, and we're just like, woo, got my mohawk on, and I'm just praising Jesus. Now, I know this would have been super traumatic for everybody else that was there, but I just wanted to be like, boom, I'm in heaven, right, right away. That would have been awesome, amazing thing to just be that. But God said, no, get out of the boat. He said, no, you need to step out into this new position that I have for you. And you're like, wait. It's scary out there. Not everybody's going to like the things you say. Not everybody's going to be cheering for you to do well at this new position. Not everybody's going to, you know what, if you're not careful, if you don't keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to start to doubt. And that's what God said, Chris, get out of the boat. I'm like, okay, right? Jump out there. What's he calling you to get out of? Now listen, I'm not telling you that he wants you all to quit your job and just serve Jesus, okay? Because I'm going to be honest with you, the second hardest thing I ever did in my life was to quit coaching. I love coaching football. In fact, you'll still find me late at night watching old highlight videos, or you'll see me during a football game on the college. I'm reading the safety and which way he rolls down, and I, I still in my mind do all of these different things because I loved coaching, and every day was like a mission trip. When I was teaching in school, 120 kids had to come to my classroom every day. They had no choice. They had to come there. 200 football players every day had to come spend time with me. So I had an opportunity every day to be the light of Jesus in the school. We need more teachers like that. We need people in your workplace to be the light of the world. And I loved being the light of the world right in it. And God said, no, nope, I want you to go out. I want you to train other people how to do that. So now I'm like that little like, thing, you know, tch, 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 and it puts the little flame, right? That's me. I'm that little like, big starter thing, and I'm supposed to light your fire so that you take Jesus into everybody else, right? Like, you're not supposed to bring them to me for me to tell them about Jesus. You're supposed to go tell them about Jesus because you have a relationship with them because you love these people. You love your neighbor. You love your family. You love your coworkers. Well, most of them, right? And so you love most of these people. If not, we need to get our love right, but you need to be telling them about Jesus, where you're at. This is the army of God to go in the world and, and to be the light of the world. And so that was a huge step for me to say, I'm going to give up this dream to do what you want me to do, Lord. I'm going to give up this desire to do what you want me to do, Lord. And that's what God's calling us to do, to step out and do what God wants us to do every day. And when you get home, recharge. When you get up in the morning, recharge so you'll be full force ready to go into the world and tell people about Jesus. Guys, Christmas is the one time everybody will listen to the story. 
And in fact, if you didn't know the story of what we're going to do at a night in Bethlehem this year, we're taking the wise men and their gifts, and we're going further than we ever have before in this story because, you know, the gifts of gold helped Jesus escape into Egypt, frankincense for prayers, but the myrrh was for the burial and resurrection of Jesus. And this year, you might notice in the back a beautiful set um, that has crosses on them because we're going to take people all the way past the manger to the cross and to the empty tomb and tell them about Jesus this year. This is the year for us to go all the way through the gospel and say, this is why Jesus came in the manger, in order to save the world. And so we have that same story. Maybe without sets and costumes, we have the same story that we can talk to other people about it because there is a chance for hope in our world. Let's finish this story because, you know, Peter goes out there, he starts to sink, and, and Jesus is like, hey, come on, buddy, let's go back in the boat, right? But after this story, guess what? He doesn't say, like, Peter, why don't you just take a time out because of that big failure you had out there? In fact, if it was today's world, the disciples would have been on the boat with their cameras and, like, ha, sunk, fail video, viral, right away, right? So that would have been the, but here Jesus is, he takes them over to the other side, and immediately, like, when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gesserinet and moored to the shore, and when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And they ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they had heard he was. So Jesus gets off the boat, and he's right back to ministry. He's been recharged on the mountain. He's shown his glory to the disciples on the boat. He's like, guys, back to work. We can't just sit around and go, oh, that was really great. Like, no, let's go, let's go serve these people. Let's minister to the sick and whenever they, wherever they came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many who touched it were made well. I wonder where they got an idea of touching the hem of his garment. Maybe the testimony of this woman that had been healed. Maybe she had been spread in the story of what Jesus could do. And everybody else like, there's hope. And just getting near him and touching him, there's hope in Jesus. Um, I want to finish with this. If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Because as we've been walking through these stories of Jesus' life, we've been looking back in the Old Testament for any of these kind of echoes or like leftover footprints of, of what God was doing in Jesus' life. And, and last week, remember, we went back to 2 Kings chapter 4 and we found out that Elisha had done this feeding of people with these barley loaves as well. And so I went through Google, which I hope is not of the devil, but I went through a Google search. For when has the Sea of Galilee appeared any other times in the Bible, right? And so I searched about Sea of Galilee, and there's, another, there's only one reference in the Old Testament of this Sea of Galilee that Jesus walked across. It was found in Isaiah uh, chapter 9. Let's, go to, let's start in verse 1. It says, But there, was no, there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into, the, into contempt the land of Zebulun, in the land of Nephalti. But in the later times, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nation. So in Isaiah, um, he starts prophesying that God has made glorious the way of the sea. What sea? The Sea of Galilee, meaning that the Messiah, the promised one, was going to come into this region and be the light of the world. Maybe we could stretch it and say the glorious, the way of the sea was him walking across it. We don't know. But we know this is interesting. Because in this story, right, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And he says this in verse 2. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shown. And we know who this light is, right? This light. That is Jesus. John chapter 1 tells us, you have multiplied the nation and you have increased its joy. Anybody use some increased joy this week? I know I could every week. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of the oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. So this oppressor that has been on them, God is going to break that oppression. Cover the earth, right? Let the Spirit of God come in and crash through our lives and break down the strongholds. Shame has no place in our life. Fear has no place in our life. Chains will be broken when God's presence is there. 
For every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle of tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And who is that person? Jesus, right? We read this verse around Christmas time, not realizing that this prophecy is about the hope of the world that's going to be living in the way of Galilee. And he says, upon him, or the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Anybody need a Wonderful Counselor? Any of us need help in our mind making it work out the way we want it to work out? We have a Wonderful Counselor, the Holy Spirit, Jesus right, that has given us the Holy Spirit to be our counselor. Jesus is going to be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Lord, give us more peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And then it finishes with this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That word zeal means the passion of the Lord. The zeal of the Lord. He is eager to be our wonderful counselor. He is eager to be our mighty God. He is eager to transform our lives to make us like him. Are we eager? Are we passionate about these things? I pray that we are. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you just amazed at your word, Lord. For unto us a child has been born. That's the season that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to have zeal and passion to tell others about you. Lord, I thank you that you are in the, um, you do miracles, Lord. You're in the works of our world, Lord, and you are eager to show us your glory. Lord, help us to not Explain those things away when you do something that is miraculous, when you answer our prayers, when you show us your glory, Lord, help us to give it all to you. So I pray for this season coming up, Lord, as we have an opportunity to to share the gospel with people at a night in Bethlehem, Lord, we pray uh, for your protection and your safety to be over our event. Lord, I pray that you will help us to clearly communicate how incredible you are, that you are the king of the world, and Lord, that we have an opportunity to show people the empty tomb. The Lord, you have risen, and you have risen indeed. Lord, you are the true reason that we even have this season that we live in right now. Help us, Lord, to be your faithful followers. Lord, I pray for each one of us in this room that we need to take a step out of the boat to be like you, to be where you're working. Lord, give us that boldness this week, Lord. And when we fail, help us to be surrounded by people that will give us grace and show us your truth, Lord, from your word. I thank you, Lord, so much for this church and just the the heart of giving that they have, Lord. I pray that you will bless them this week, Lord, and give us opportunities to be like you. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. We love you guys. Don't forget to pick up costumes, and we'll see you next week. Have a great week. Turns to light in you.